two agile coaches, they're evil, and they commit a murder, and uh, they get caught, convicted, and because it's Texas, sentenced to death. There's this tradition in Texas that you get one last wish before you die, like a good meal or something. So they're sitting in the jail cell, and the jailer comes in and looks at them and says, boys, tomorrow you die. You get one last wish, what would you like? And the first uh, agile coach looks at the jailer and says, Mr. Jailer, I have always had the desire to present a thorough and academic lecture on the subject of modern methodology. If I could do that before I die, I'd be a happy man. And the jailer looks up and goes, you're a sick man. <laughs> but I tell you what, tomorrow at noon we'll round up all the prisoners, bring them to the auditorium, you can give your talk, and then we'll kill you. So then he turns to the second agile coach, listen to this, boy, you get one last wish too, what would you like? The second agile coach looks at the jailer, Mr. Jailer, please have mercy on me, there's only one thing I need now, can you kill me before noon tomorrow? <laughs> which is pretty much how I feel about the whole subject. <laughs> I'd much rather be here doing some mob programming with you, but okay, let's not. So how this will work is that I'm going to give a brief introduction for around 10 minutes to some of the uh, big ideas. And then we're gonna do for the rest of an hour and a half or so, a structured Q&A in which we'll explore this through your concerns and questions. Let's start with a, a brief introduction. And I'd like to pick up the question of scaling. So as a caution, this is the first large software intensive product development ever in the history of the world. It's the Sage system, late 50s, early 60s. And it eventually involved way more programmers than was originally anticipated and took a lot more time. And when it was over, one of the directors was asked, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do different? And he said, find the 10 best people and write the entire thing themselves. And this is a wonderful lesson from the very first large software intensive product development, which uh, I think is well worth taking away with us. Uh, I've been working for, I guess, decades in large multi-site and offshore development. And I'd kind of like to boil down uh, my key advice. Don't, don't, and don't. The reasons why, it seems to me, people think that you need a lot of bodies to develop a system is often related to thinking mistakes or misapprehension of the nature of our systems both cognitive, social, and work systems and their interactions. Like the fallacious belief that there's a linear relationship between uh, the size of requirements and effort, when in fact Kokomo 2, Barry Bain, parametric modeling shows that in fact there's a super linear relationship. Like the belief that uh, programmer productivity variance is sort of on a linear curve when the largest meta-analysis study, Prekalt 1995, of all of their productivity studies, lumping into quartiles, the medians in the quartiles, show that the median in the top quartile, 400% over the median in the bottom quartile. And those aren't outliers. Those are just median numbers, 400%. It's hard to find, maybe there are, but I don't know of a lot of other knowledge worker domains where you see those kinds of variations. So, uh, and thinking, having the thinking mistake that software development is, is some kind of like digging coal out of a coal mine, uh, some kind of manual labor activity, instead of 
to quote Kent Beck, the creator of XP and one of the founders of the Agile movement, programming is a learning activity with code as a side effect. And that's a really, it seems to me, a really insightful statement. And when you don't understand the nature of these things, that you think that software is some kind of a, a linear, manual activity, building instead of creating, coding instead of learning, um, then with these thinking mistakes, it's very hard to understand how you could build something apparently complex with a small number of people. Multi-site, okay, you do a merger or acquisition and you get another site, so you're stuck with it for a while. But at least you could shut it down. Uh, but that often doesn't happen. And this, it seems to me, is related to uh, people, usually site managers, people involved in these kinds of decisions, not being at the real place of work. And unless you actually work as a hands-on programmer, I work regularly as a hands-on developer. Bus Boda, the co-creator of Less, is a, just a world-class master programmer. Um, unless you actually work close to the real work and spend thousands of hours all the time really with the real work, and if, on the other hand, you're in a kind of a fantasy land of managers looking at numbers in status meetings, then you can't grasp the nature of the problems that arise with something like multi-site development. It's all very abstracted. So I think the root cause there is uh, not being at the place of real work and seeing what's really going on. Offshore, uh, which I'll use as a synonym for low-cost sites, and this thinking mistake is related to, oh, but Accenture told us that their programmers are just wonderful and cheap. Isn't that true? And you'll have that fantasy uh, if you don't actually spend time doing mob programming or pair programming in for years in China or India like Bas and I have done and actually seeing with your own eyes as a master programmer uh, the crap that is produced and uh, not appreciating the consequences of this. So a lot of this is due to thinking mistakes. A lot of the, it seems to me, the root causes of thinking mistakes is uh, not being close to the real work. But some groups are still going to scale for reasons compelling like uh, we work a lot in telecom equipment uh, creation, and it's hard to build radio towers and base stations and 100 million lines of code with just seven people. So is less for scaling? And I'd like to apologize for a false advertising. Uh, less is not for scaling. And... Um, People often ask me, what is the, you know, what's a great framework for scaling? Is less a good framework for scaling? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But what less is for, and is, I would argue, probably the best system for the following, is that it's uh, really good for descaling. And that's what less is for. How can we apply Agile at scale in our big, uh, complex organization? I hear this question a lot. You probably had this question. And I'd like to suggest that maybe this is the, the wrong question. Because underlying this question, I think, is the assumption that we have to have a big, complex organization. And then out of that... Uh, constraint or a priori belief comes the question, well, how do we layer on top of this something to do Agile? But I'd like to suggest that our big and complex organizations are a self-inflicted wound. And they're a kind of artificial complexity 
that arises primarily out of the local optimization thinking mistake, whose roots are the plains of Africa. And I'm not trying to be cute. Because in terms of evolutionary psychology, our homo genus brains, we didn't evolve for contemplating the question, what are going to be the interaction effects in 17 months of setting up a low-cost development site in the Philippines with 27 JavaScript programmers? Our brains didn't evolve for that. We evolved for the here and now. And local is the way that our, our default uh, mode of thinking evolves. And so systems thinking, which is at the root of less, uh, is not something that comes natural to us. And because we're not naturally systems thinkers, uh, we assume that our local optimization thinking mistakes are obviously common sense. Out of that comes whole organizational designs that are rooted in the foundation of local optimization thinking mistake. And then on top of that, we ask the question, how can we do Agile? Instead of uh, a different question, which is, how can we simplify the unnecessarily big and complex organizational design and be Agile rather than uh, do Agile? And just while I'm thinking of it, then let me just pick up on this word for a moment. I often suggest people just contemplate uh, the key words chosen by the founder of a system and ask the question, what did the founders, why, do, why was that word chosen? Uh, this is often a useful way to kind of grasp some intent behind the idea. Does anyone know uh, the when and where of the choice of this word? Yeah. Not exactly, no. Um, the question very precisely is when and where was this appellation chosen for this movement? 2001, Snowbird, Utah. And uh, to give you the potted history of all of this, in uh, October of 2000, Bob Martin sent me an email and and uh, an email to uh, Jeff Sutherland, Ward Cunningham, uh, Kent Beck, and a few others, and said, uh, Bob said, I want to have a meeting uh, in February uh, 2001, February, March, I can't remember. And Bob said, to paraphrase in, in his email, uh, I want a name, and I want a manifesto. It was really Bob that uh, was a driver behind uh, this, though a lot of people don't, don't know that part of the history. And uh, then emails went around, where are we going to hold this meeting? And uh, as a good Canadian, I suggested the Caribbean. Because <laughs> I'm not crazy. <laughs> uh, but uh, Alistair Colburn and Jim Highsmith, they were living in Salt Lake City at the time in Utah. And they suggested, hey, the, snowing's, the snow and skiing is great here in February. Why don't you come to Utah? So I got outvoted, and Snowbird, Utah it was. And uh, just a couple of days before the meeting, there was an emergency crisis that I had to attend to in France, so I had to skip the meeting and head off. But uh, I basically know the background then of uh, what happened there. And so one of the things that the group wanted to do was have a name. And uh, it was the group decided that they were going to vote on this. And so uh, one of the first steps was, um, uh, OK, anyone got candidate names? Now, one of the key people uh, there was a guy named Jim Highsmith, one of the uh, progenitors of the Agile movement. And uh, does anyone remember what Jim Highsmith's 1990 book was, 1999 book that was very influential in our movement? Adaptive Software Development? Yeah. 
And this was a, a real influential book back in the day. And Jim Highsmith's company was called Adaptive Software Development, and Jim Highsmith's method framework was Adaptive Software Development. So at this meeting, when the list of options was being made, what word do you think Jim <laughs> offered? Adaptive. Now, Mike Beadle was also at the meeting, and he'd recently read a paper about, uh, related to this, American manufacturing and agile manufacturing. And the word caught in Mike's mind, and uh, he offered the word agile. Now, here's a little bit of inside politics uh, that you might find interesting. So the two words are being voted on, adaptive and agile. And everyone there is a consultant, self-employed. And they all figured, you know, if we vote for adaptive, Jim's going to get all the business. <laughs> and the only reason that the word agile won out, squeaked by in the votes over adaptive, was because we didn't want Jim to get all the business. <laughs> and that's why it's called agile. That's the real history of the word. But I want to wind this back to my slide. Because the point is that both of the words were synonyms adaptive, agile, for flexible. And I can tell you that in all of our minds in the discussion at the time, none of us were thinking fast. None of us were thinking quality. We weren't thinking high business value. We weren't thinking efficient. We all had a, a common idea in mind, which was to communicate a, an idea of development based upon uh, ignorance, based upon the humility to say, we don't know. And moving from the pretense of knowledge, the pretense of prediction, the pretense of knowing, to having the space and openness to say, I, I don't know. We're going to have to learn our way to greatness. And we're going to have to create a system based upon learning cycles rather than prediction. And that's why, that was all in our minds. So we were all thinking flexible, adaptive, agile development where learning cycle, learn, change direction. And so obviously, that's what we were thinking. But... People have missed an important point in this idea, and that is that there's a corollary implication that there's a cost of change. Does anyone remember Kent Beck's subtitle of his first major book? What was the subtitle? What's the super title? Explained. XP Explained. What was the subtitle? <laughs> Embrace Change. And what was the theme and thesis of the main first opening chapter? Be a better person. No, that's so pop psych. <laughs> <laughs> no. It, no, it was and is that if we want a system like this, we got to make the cost of change low. That was, that was a key message that we were trying to communicate, that, okay, learning cycle-based development with the humility of ignorance rather than the pretense of knowledge and predicting. Corollary. There's going to be a cost of change. And in order to make these systems work effectively, we've got to drive down the cost of change. And that was really uh, the opening thesis of the Agile movement, was not change, but drive down the cost of change and the frictions of it to make change cheap so that you can use uh, change and learning as the way to find yourself to success. That's the big idea. Coming back to the slide, uh, be agile, 
rather than do Agile. So Agile, it seems to me, from what we were trying to express and suggest, is a quality of the system. It's not a practice. It's the, as I would say, the ability to turn on a dime for a dime. Turn on a dime for a dime. So that the organizational design is such that the organizational system, to distinguish between those two things, the organizational design is the formal choice of design elements. The organizational system is the instantiated instance out of that design expressed in reality how it's actually happening. And sometimes there's even a relationship between those two things. And that the organizational system expresses the equality of agility that it can turn on a dime for a dime in the presence of learning. And I think in large scale product development, the first order, and now I'm speaking mathematically or in terms of physics, the first order forces for these costs of change as opposed to second or third order forces, are in the organizational structures. They're not in the practices. The influences of the practices are secondary or tertiary. So the existence or absence of sites, groups, roles, and so forth. These structural elements, these are the first order forces that uh, inhibit or enhance being able to turn on a dime for a dime at scale. And all practices and feeling good and being nice people, eh, whatever. It's really quite secondary or tertiary in how the systems at large scale are going to behave. And so it, the suggestion is that if you are interested in agility in a large-scale context, the main job has got nothing to do with practices or attitude or mindset or behavior or all of these nice, warm, and fuzzy things. It's eliminating groups, sites, roles, positions. It's much more fundamental. It's changing the organizational structure. And simplifying the organizational structure by mostly a deletion process. So here's another way of thinking about it. Uh, it's really kind of a lean way of thinking about it. Uh, most of the improvement comes from deleting, not adding. And so what Les is trying to do is descale organizational complexity and trying to uh, dissolve all of this unnecessary complexity and create an organization which solves the problems that need to be solved in a, in a simpler way. And that's why the catchphrase is uh, more with less because it's about uh, simplification and then perhaps not paradoxically, but then being able to actually uh, have more learning, more alignment with highest value, and so forth. Another reason for the catchphrase um, is what I call more thinking, less jargon, and hype. And um, I share the sentiment of of Simon, I'm really not interested in religion, hype, fads, jargon words. I would prefer never to use the word agile or scrum. I would like, and I encourage people just to use plain old English. For example, uh, someone comes to you and says, we want to do agile. Uh, ask them this, can you explain to me what you'd like in plain English? That will be a very helpful thing. Let's, when I, I could achieve one thing in life, it would be for people to stop using jargon and just use plain old English 
What do you really mean? Um, yeah, let's skip that. I'll share a few more uh, introductory um, comments. Think about a few resources, just while I'm thinking about it. We wrote the first book on Les in 2005, 2006. Les has been around since, uh, it's now I think it's in the 12th year. Uh, the second Les book, uh, a couple of years later. And um, the third Les book, uh, we've just finished up. And uh, it's just off to the press right now, so it'll be shipping in a couple of weeks. And uh, so you can learn a lot about less that way. Uh, thinking about learning resources, there's also uh, the site, less.works. And you can um, learn about it by going into things like the principles, uh, you can learn about different elements of it, like how do you do sprint planning part one. Uh, you can learn about case studies and so on and so forth. There's videos, resources. So that's another learning resource. Now, let me uh, give a brief overview to LESS itself, and then we'll close down the uh, structured introduction. This is called the less complete picture. And one of the ideas is uh, a set of experiments and a, and a culture and a mindset of scientific method. Hypothesis, experiment, collect data, uh, and then decide. And this term, an idea, in less we consider important. Um, there's a broader idea I might come back to later on. Actually, I think I'll pick it up right now. So one of the things that we think is very important, we call uh, owning your ideas instead of renting your ideas from the realm of occupational psychology. So for example, I, uh, back in the 1990s, used to help companies with the adoption of the RUP, or the Rational Unified Process, in parallel with helping groups uh, adopt XP and Scrum and so forth. And the RUP is a, a big, long list. Lots of roles, lots of uh, best practices, lots of artifacts, uh, lots of this and that. And... What I uh, observed on its, in its introduction into groups is that the, the occupational psychology dynamics is that when you push, a, and I didn't know this beforehand, it only came through sort of painful personal observation and learning, is that when you push a big list onto people, regardless of how skillful the list is, it might be full of wonderful best practices that everyone would agree, no doubt that's a wonderful list. But there's something that I discovered uh, at a deeper level is that when you try to push a big list onto people, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for psychological reasons because people don't own it. It's, they're, it they're just renting it. In fact, they might not even want to pay the rent because uh, it's just been pushed onto them. And I've come very slowly over the decades and in a way if there's only a few things that you know, I could share before I, I retire uh, over my 40 years career. This would be one of them. That we have to create a work environment in which people own their ideas and not rent them. Uh, to have a sense of engagement, intrinsic motivation, to truly want to inquire, to challenge, to want to uh, improve and having this intrinsic desire to want to improve. And pushing big lists is anathema to that, regardless of how wonderful the list is. And this is an important reason why there's so little in less. There's almost nothing in less. And it's not because Boss and I are incapable of coming up with long lists of skillful practices. 
It's for a very different reason. And you might think, oh, no, Craig, we know the list, and if we push it onto the people, this time it'll work. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. And it's frustrating because the implication of this is that you can say, well, well that, that's, there's the list. All you have to do is follow it. And it seems so frustratingly hard to have to become a teacher. And, and I just want to be a manager. I don't want to have to be a teacher. I just want to be able to be a manager and tell people the best practices and install them. You mean I got to be a teacher and inspire people to want to learn and think for themselves? Man, that's not what I signed up for. And so then we get organizations full of managers and leaders uh, that don't actually want to be teachers and use a Socratic approach to helping inspire people to think for themselves and to own their ideas, but managers of the introductions of the sets of best practices. And we'd like to suggest that that just doesn't really work. And so instead of very, very simple list, a culture of experiments and so forth. Well, experiments are great, um, but after 12 years, Craig, there must be something you can offer as advice that's more likely to be useful in terms of a pattern. And yeah, there are. And so we call those the guides. And the guides are a subset of experiments related to um, our experience and patterns and frequency of likely to help with adoption um, that we suggest in helping with successful adoptions of less. And the experiments are covered in the first two books, and the guides are covered in the new third book after 12 years of uh, experience with less. At the uh, deeper level are the two frameworks of less, and these are the core minimal structural elements uh, that we put in place. And why do we put them in place? What are we trying to optimize for? Uh, our background is as systems thinkers, so we're always thinking about, oh, if we introduce an organizational design element, what systems optimizing goal is it for? And to be clear, less is an organizational design that is consciously optimizing for working on highest business value from a company perspective and agility at a company perspective, the ability to turn on a dime for a dime. And the design of less is carefully crafted to meet those two system optimizing goals. And those are not um, good goals, they're not bad goals, they're just the goals we've chosen because typically they're the ones that companies find valuable. And if you've got different system optimizing goals like reducing cost or um, keeping people busy or secrecy, then less is the wrong model because it's not consistent with those optimizing goals. And that's what the frameworks are for. And then at the center of less are a set of principles like systems thinking and a few others. The details don't matter. I said there were two frameworks. Why not just one? Because it turns out that there's a simple case and a more complex case. And we need, unfortunately, a more complex framework for the more complex case. But we don't want to impose the more complex framework for the simpler case. We want things to be less, as simple as possible. So there's the smaller less framework, which works for up to around eight teams. And that's not a magic number. It's empirical. After around eight teams, the product owner's head explodes. You've seen Mars attack? <laughs> you know, it goes like that. When, when the product owner's head starts to swell, then you know, okay, it's time to go to the second framework called less huge. And less huge introduces more complexity. It is a divide and conquer framework. And whenever you divide, you introduce the danger of local optimization. <laughs> And so less huge is dangerous because it has the seeds of local optimization in it. And 
let me know if you can figure out a way to uh, solve this problem without divide and conquer because we haven't been able to figure it out yet. In the smaller less framework, what are the core structural elements? There is one and only one product owner. There's no such thing as a team product owner. There's one and only one product backlog. There's no such thing as a team backlog. There's two to eight teams. Each team has their own sprint backlog. There's scrum masters, and they're dedicated in less. They're not part-time in one team scrum. A scrum master could also be a developer, but in large-scale scrum, there's a more of a focus on changing the organization, and so it's a dedicated role. And one scrum master can serve between one and three teams. A really, really good scrum master can serve one team, and a crappy scrum master can serve three. <laughs> and each team has their own sprint backlog. Now, this should be very boring. Uh, that's the point. It's supposed to be very boring. If you understand Scrum, there should be almost nothing else here. This is large-scale Scrum. And so it's the least amount that we could add to one team Scrum in order to make this work with multiple teams together while trying to maintain the elegance, the simplicity of Scrum, and help it still achieve the goals that it's trying to achieve. Uh, agility, transparency, empirical process control, and so forth. These are the roles in LESS. Uh, product owner, teams, as opposed to team, Scrum master, and those three roles should be very boring, and there's nothing new to be said there. There's an optional role in Scrum, um, managers. They're optional and less, but quite common in large scale. And what is the role, what is the responsibility of managers in less? It's to improve the capability of the system. They've got virtually nothing to do with the development. The development is handled by the self-managing teams and the product owner, who's typically the head of product management. So any supporting managers, it, I'm exaggerating, but it's as though they wouldn't even know what product you're making. Uh, their job is focused completely inward on improving the organizational design. For example, some years ago, there was a company called b Party doing a less adoption. They're an online gaming company. And I was working with um, Kickoff with the senior management team in Vienna. And a new product owner of, I think it was the poker, uh, the poker product, joined day one. And uh, the new product owner, I was there in the meeting with him, with some other people, was saying kind of as an aside, uh, so uh, my first day here, where are my teams? And um, the other manager said to the product owner, oh, they're in uh, the Ukraine. And so the uh, new product owner said, oh, so I'm going to have to catch a plane uh, from uh, uh, Vienna to Kiev. It's not such a long distance, not a big deal. And then I can meet them in Kiev. No, they're not in Kiev. They're in a town that requires you to take a bus for an hour and then a train for three hours, and then you can get to them. So then the product owner said, um, that's not going to work. Um, please close down that site and then uh, set up a relocation for opening up a new site in Kiev and solve that problem for me, please. And that's the role of managers in a less adoption. It's to improve the organizational design. From an event perspective, there is one common sprint. It's not asynchronous for each team. So you got seven teams. They're all working to end the sprint at noon UTC zero on July 17th uh, with a shippable product with the intent to actually truly ship it to the market. Every sprint 
from the first sprint. Uh, there's one common sprint review involving all the teams together or representatives. Each team has their own sprint planning part two separately. Product backlog refinement can involve uh, more specialized techniques such as multi-team PBR, overall PBR. Uh, there's a plethora of coordination techniques available in LAS for many teams to work together. Um, there's one common sprint review at the end, usually using a technique called a sprint review bazaar. Uh, separate team level retrospectives. And the one new meeting added to large scale scrum over one team scrum is the overall retrospective because we want to focus on improving the system as a whole and the team level retrospectives aren't doing that. So there's one additional meeting to large scale scrum over one team scrum. This should be very boring uh, and that's the purpose. It's the smallest uh, addition to basic scrum that we could figure out how to make this work. And that concludes uh, the introduction to less. We're going to spend the rest of our time together in a structured Q&A. And step one will be finding a partner, like for example, you two folks and so forth. And with your partner, your goal is to talk together and generate questions for me. And somebody can write them down or however you can remember them. I'll be setting the clock for three minutes. And after three minutes, we're going to come back together. Find a partner. Please generate some questions. So for each pair, I'd like you to decide who is the official question holder. Now, I'd like to confer godlike powers to the question holders. You get to decide the priority of your questions. And uh, we're going to start with people born in the month of January. So do we have someone born in the month of January right here? <laughs> Hi. Bloody hell, I've got mic. <laughs> Might just be flipping it on. Yeah, I think they for the uh, video they wanted to record it, but I'll repeat the question. Two questions. One, one is very quick. Okay. Uh, um, you know, think? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the first one. I didn't understand this concept of local optimization. I, I didn't understand. Ah, that. yeah. Uh, um, that will be a long answer. Let's just stop there. But it's very important. Okay. Okay. Um, is you got up to you got up, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> you got up to seven teams, eight teams um, running concurrently, and you're saying you deliver or deliver at the same point in time. Yes. How do you ensure that sync? How, how do you ensure that they're actually um, finishing or right. delivering at the same time? So let's take the first question first. Uh, what is local optimization? The way it's uh, sometimes classically taught in systems thinking is with uh, this analogy called watch the ball, not the players. Imagine um, that, uh, well, let's do it here. Imagine that this is a rugby field and this is a ball and uh, we're trying to get it across the goal line this way. And I run up to the ball, and uh, I'm trying to get it on the goal, across the goal line this way. And I check my business card, and it says, Craig, kicker. And so I say, uh, you know, I could pick up this ball and move it across the goal line, but um, that's not my job. My job is to be the kicker. And so I'm going to wait for the work to come to me. And uh, this is one example of local optimization. I'm optimizing locally on my, for example, one skill. Now, to take this farther, um, I then furthermore say, uh, and by the way, Simon, um, 
he's been uh, measured how fast he can pick up the ball, and he can pick it up faster than me. So, listen carefully, I'm going to wait for the person who can do it faster. And in a way, this captures, this encapsulates the thinking mistake of local optimization. So Simon comes over, he checks his business card, it says picker upper, so he uh, does that. And then he says, well, I could go across the goal line, but my job title says picker upper, uh, not runner. And anyways, it's Catherine, if I recall? Charlie, I'm sorry. I knew, I knew there was a C in there somewhere. Uh, and Charlie's been measured uh, for running, and she can run a lot faster than Simon. So Simon's going to wait for the person who can do it faster. And this metaphor encapsulates so much of the local optimization thinking mistake, where we're watching the players instead of watching the ball. Because from the point of view of the paying customer, Uh, our individual local optimizations are the exact opposite of what they would want. They would want us to go to the work, and instead of locally optimizing on my task, they would want them to go to the work. Now let me take this farther then into the, out of the realm of metaphor, into the world of large-scale, software-intensive product development. So a rhetorical question Uh, I go to a group and I say, why do you have front-end JavaScript programmers? Well, Craig, it's obvious. It's best and most efficient. Why do you have separate business analysts? Well, Craig, it's obvious. It's best and most efficient. Why do you have testers? It's obvious. It's best and most efficient. Why do you have back-end programmers? Same answer, and on and on and on. These are all examples of single specialty roles or groups. And if you ask, why do you have a single specialty role or group, invariably people will say, well, it's obvious, it's best, it's productive, it's efficient. But you know, if you stand back and look at the entire system in time and space and you stop looking locally and you broaden to systems view and systems thinking, what happens from the customer perspective to total cycle time by having those single specialist groups? Does it increase or get shorter? It increases. And what happens to working on highest business value by having these single specialist groups? People are working on low value because you have to feed work to the constraint of the person. As a simple example, suppose you've got a large-scale product with 25 components and you've got component teams. And component team 25, if you look at the requirements from the point of view of customer value, the first one that they need to work on is number 1,000 as a thought experiment. But what do they do on day one? You have to keep them busy. So you say, here, do your part of number 1,000 from the point of view of business value. And so organizations based upon local optimization are also sub-optimizing with respect to business value. So if you were to ask the customer, uh, are you getting high business value by having a group where everyone's doing just one thing? No, the exact opposite. So these local optimizations, they look efficient, best, productive, but only locally. And when you step back and look at the system as a whole, it's the exact opposite. And this thinking mistake, and it really is a Plains of Africa thinking mistake, because we've evolved for that kind of local here and now, it's so common sense. This thinking mistake is what underlies organizational designs that are based upon single specialist groups. And this is, this is what has to be rooted out to create an organization that's based upon systems optimization. And thus, we'll have to eliminate all of those single function groups, all of those component teams, and move to a model of feature teams that are cross-component, cross-functional, T-shaped teams composed of T-shaped workers. So that's the first question. Did that help with the first question? Uh, yeah, it's a concept... Um it's a concept I'm familiar with. It's just yeah. we never ever called it local optimization. It's more the silo mentality. The S- uh, silo mentality is, um, you know, consider the word silo. It's separation. 
Well, that's, that's uh, what, but silo mentality is not exactly the same thing as local optimization. But from what you described. That's, yeah, that's it, exactly it has the same, same consequence, yeah. but there's slightly different points. Because when it's characterized as local optimization, which is a classic term for this thinking mistake, right. uh, it's because, you know, like if you ask, why is there a silo? Why is there a silo? People will say, well, it's obvious. It's best. It's most efficient. So the underlying driver is the local efficiency thinking mistake. Yeah. Fair enough. Can, can, it's, I, yeah. can I just ask, though, what do you say to people that say that it's, it's the backbone of industrialization, it's the opening chapter of the wealth of nations, and it is emblazoned on the back of a British 20-pound note? Yes. Yeah. It's that embedded in our culture. How do you respond to that? Uh, well, asking the question that way is like a religious argument. And I have no interest in religion. uh, My approach is extremely logical. And so, you know, it's just an irrelevant, it's not a, it's not a logical argument. Uh, The question is, for example, does the CEO want to optimize their company for working on highest business value? And does the CEO want to optimize the company for agility, the ability to change direction in response to learning? And if you have single function roles or groups, that organizational design is inconsistent with those optimizing goals. On the other hand, single function groups and roles are uh, system optimal for certain other goals, such as busyness or efficiency in the context of zero variability. So for example, if you do a simulation with a zero variability system, Uh, with either machine parts or humans that do one thing, the system can produce relatively efficiently with respect to cycle time. As soon as you introduce variability into the system, then that model is inconsistent. And R&D, research and development, software development, is a domain of variability and learning. It's not a a domain of uh, predictability. I would suggest that the question maybe is more fundamental than that. The question is, why? Why can't I test this? If I understand the code, why can't I code this? If I, if I understand analysis, why can't I, anal- I, I you know, analyze this? Yeah. Well, why, why does a tester need to test um, uh, you know, a system that we're looking to put into production? Um, that's the silo mentality that uh, I was kind of like alluding to. Sure. Uh, and it's one of the biggest barriers that we're currently facing in the sure. organization. The and uh, your second question was how do these seven or eight teams coordinate to deliver a common product together? Um, There are a number of uh, coordination mechanisms that teams use in LESS. The quick answer is they can use any technique they want because it's large-scale Scrum, and broadly, Scrum doesn't tell you how to do anything. Uh, not because Ken Schwaber or me or others are incapable of coming up with good lists, but because we need to own our ideas and not rent them, and because we want to encourage continuous improvement in which the people come up with their own solutions. That's an important caveat to what I'm going to say. Now, a common uh, solution, however, for this is a technique called... continuous integration. And I want to share with you the surprising meaning of continuous integration because not everybody knows. Continuous integration means to integrate continuously. (laughs) And that might sound like a surprise, but I go to so many large groups and I ask, are you doing continuous integration? And you know what the answer? They say, yes, we have Jenkins. They've conflated continuous integration with a build tool or a build server. Continuous integration's got nothing to do with a build server, and you can quickly spot someone who doesn't understand the subject if they were to suggest that. It's a behavior by programmers. It's the behavior to integrate continuously. And I'm an old XP, so I'm going to break this down from, you know, where this comes from XP, so I'm going to break it down from the point of view of uh, the XP world where this idea comes from that we were trying to communicate. What does it really mean? So 
it means to integrate continuously. For example, suppose you're a programmer and you check out a file, a Java file, from Git or Subversion. And suppose you keep it checked out for a long, long, long time, like one hour. If you were to keep a file checked out for a hellaciously long time, like one hour, and so too were all the other 50 or 100 programmers in your product, you're not integrating continuously. You're delaying integration. And you can have Jenkins servers out the wazoo, which I've never figured out where that is yet, but let's say. You can have Jenkins servers out the wazoo, running at the speed of light. And if everyone is delaying integrating by one hour, you're not integrating continuously. So the heart of integrating continuously is that the checkout check-in cycle time, this will be an acronym-rich bullet point, is as short as possible. That's the heart of integrating continuously. Now, there's a question begged in this point. What is that begged question? What is as short as possible? Bingo. And remember, this comes from XP, there, was a co there is a complementary practice in XP that answers this question. What is that practice? TDD. And the idea was and is as short as possible is one TDD cycle. And the median for one TDD cycle in Java is around three minutes. So uh, then the idea of integrating continuously is you check out your one file, you do one TDD cycle, three minutes, and then you commit the shortest possible cycle. So you develop one test, test it, put it back in. Right, and you'll run a set of smoke tests locally and so forth. Yeah. Now... Uh, I just said you commit. Let's pick up git. When you commit, where are you committing to? Locally. And to uh, leave aside the modern terminology of git, if you have a local repository in traditional version control language, what is that thing? That's true, but in terms of the traditional language of version control, it's a branch. Every local repository is a branch. And so the second big idea in integrating continuously is to avoid branches. No developer branches, no feature branches, no team branches, all of these delay integration. And so in Git terminology, that would mean commit, push to master. Commit, push to master every three minutes. Yeah? And then you're delaying integration. And therefore, they've delayed integration. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Um, imagine that they create this local branch at noon on day one. Okay? At what, as, an, as a realistic example, at what day and time are they finished? Yeah, but but what would be in your um, in your experience or the context? What would be the time? Yeah. Uh, yes, but there's a devil in this detail. Like for example, um, 
as short as possible, your answer is not as possible because my answer is shorter. What's that? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, then, and then if I have, say I have 10 feet of local, I can lock some because they can work or they're that good. Right. We've had a conversation with the product owner or the team, but for whatever the reason, it doesn't matter. Right? But right. as soon as they do pick up, I'm dead. Right. Then they go straight. Right. In TDD, the code is tested all the time. So there's no need to delay. And the cycle time that you're describing is more than three minutes, and therefore there's more delay than three minutes. Sure. And you're delaying the discovery by delaying integration. But let's move on. So the idea then is to avoid branches and have everybody pushing all the code together all the time. And another one of the reasons for this is that unless we communicate in code, so one of the ways that the seven teams figure out who to coordinate with, who to talk with when there's problems, is by using continuous integration as a signaling mechanism to tell us there's some problem. And if we delay integrating all the code all the time, it also means that there's been a delay in signaling uh, that there's some problem, which leads to a delay in coordination. So that's one of the key mechanisms in LESS for uh, being able to deliver. It just sounds to me very overly simplistic. I mean, you, you work in complex systems. Three minutes, okay, I should accept three minutes, but, you know, you work into a test. You, you outline your test, you develop the mm. I think we'll move on. The point is that it can be done, and I think that it just, what you really mean is, I don't know how to do it. Uh, because there's a whole world of uh, groups that are doing this. So let's move on to another January question. Oh, no, I can pretend to. What, what, what's your That's month? February. Uh, let's pick up another January if there is one, and then we'll move to February. We got February. Okay. All right. You could talk straight into it like that. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. I wanted, Craig, to, if you can go back, you said the organizational design optimization. You had two specific goals, mm -hmm. and I was not fast enough to write them down. Could you review those? Two One goals? is to work on the highest customer value from the company perspective, which is going to be based upon learning, and so the understanding of what that is could change every minute of every day which means that it needs to be an adaptive answer. And the second is agility, which is the ability to turn on a dime for a dime, the ability of the group to change direction based upon learning with essentially no friction and cost. Good enough? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. February. Yes. Hi. Can you explain how a product owner looks after eight teams? I, I, my product owners struggle with one team. One product backlog. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the question. Uh, I've discovered is based upon a widespread misunderstanding of the role of the product owner. So this is from Ken Schwaber, the creator of Scrum, as you know. And in Scrum, uh, from the Scrum Guide, the, this is the quote from the Scrum Guide, uh, the product owner if it's commercial external development, is the product manager. And if it's internal development, the manager of the business function uh, receiving the software. 
notice that neither of, neither of these roles is another name for business analyst. And there's been such a misunderstanding about this that Ken at Scrum.org, the creator of Scrum, has recently arranged uh, writing a post to explain to people that many people thought the product owner is just another name for business analyst, and that's not true. This is, again, from Ken. These, uh, the product owner, again, this is all from Ken Schreiber, the creator of Scrum, the product owner is an entrepreneur, innovator, capitalist, a mini-CEO. The, the real idea of the product owner in Scrum has got nothing to do with a business analyst who's acting as a middleman in between the users and the team. And uh, for a variety of reasons, which are not all clear to me, the intention and meaning of the role of product owner has gotten distorted into another name for business analyst. And Ken's trying to correct this. And in less, uh, it's just like in real Scrum as originally intended. There's one real product owner who's the head of product management, and there are no separate intermediate business analysts. Do you know where in Scrum where business analysts are supposed to go? Into the team. They're just a regular team member. And in, and in real Scrum, who's supposed to do the product backlog refinement? The team. It's not a product owner responsibility. It's the team that does it. And uh, in one team Scrum, you know, remember, the, consider the background of Scrum. The context was the entire commercial product takes one team of seven people with a product manager who's the product owner, the owner of the product. And um, in that context, organically or naturally, the team will be doing the refinement and clarification and talking to users and customers. And that was all implicitly understood in Scrum. Like, why would you have to explain to a team that they're doing the clarification and refinement? It's obvious in that kind of one-team world. It's in the scaling context where people have lost the plot and misunderstood the idea of one-team Scrum, that it's the team that's engaged with the users and customers. The product owner's role is to prioritize and do visioning, not to act as a middleman in between. And so that's why it's possible, because uh, then to pick up the... Uh, uh, let me see if I can pick up the rule... So unless we've had to spell out what was always the intention of one team scrum, that prioritization goes through the product owner, but clarification refinement is as much as possible directly between the teams and the customers, users, and other stakeholders. And when you understand this correct original meaning of the product owner, the question kind of goes away because the product owner isn't doing all of that business analysis work. It's the team's responsibility. Yeah which leads to multiple good things, an increase in empathy and engagement by the teams of the real customers and market, reduction of many of the wastes that happen by adding middlemen between the teams and the real users, uh, the ability of the teams to make more informed decisions uh, because they understand the business and the customers and markets and so forth more. Good enough? All right. Is that February or is it a follow-up? Follow yeah, sure. So I have a question about um, these two key responsibilities, if you will, of a product owner that's split up in this way and less. So prioritization, I understand, has to go through someone who is really empowered to make those decisions and right. has the uh, understanding to make it well. But in a way, um, I've always wondered how clarification is that different to prioritization in the sense that when you're clarifying something uh, for a team, that might be a feature that we're building for multiple different user sets, different types of customers, then there might be an element of prioritization that goes into the clarification itself. So if in less, if we're saying the teams are doing the clarification themselves, what if they run up against one of those situations where they get conflicting clarifications from different users feeding into the same thing that they're trying to build? Who helps resolve that for right. a list? So team? the teams in less do not make any prioritization decisions. Um, 
I think what you're trying to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that clarification can inform prioritization. It's not that clarification is prioritization. It's that through clarifying, you could have more information that could help you in prioritizing. Uh, I am saying that, but I'm also saying that throughout, say, throughout a sprint cycle, yeah. um, if we're clarifying things, so of course we're clarifying things for the purpose of refinement to get things ready in the first place. Mm -hmm. But throughout the sprint, we might be clarifying things with our end users, or hopefully we are doing some of that. We might run up against the decision that needs to be made. Do we build a specific type of solution or a different solution? And right. we have conflicting views coming from our end users. Right. In that case, do we see that as a clarification issue, or is that really... We're trying to come up, obviously, with a solution that would work for both, but in the instance where we cannot come up with that, yeah. uh, which one goes on the product backlog and which one do we do now? Um, that's ultimately a prioritization decision, and it's through the clarification that we've l l gone to a new prioritization. So what do you think the teams would do in that case? Suppose, for example, that uh, the teams uh, came to this discovery. There's two cases. The, the one and only one product owner is in the meeting uh, with the teams and the users, in which case, problem solved. The other case is that the product owner maybe is in another meeting with other teams or something. So if the teams were to discover what this... What do you think that they would do? So I guess that is, that is my question and my concern because I worry about teams who face this a lot and have only one product owner that can resolve this for them. So they might make a decision and might make the wrong decision. Right. So the teams but don't make decisions. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure unless. The teams don't make decisions. So if the teams saw that there was a fork in the road, uh, what would they do? Well, that's my question to you, really. What okay. do they do with well, what one do you, product what do you think, owner What do you think that they teams? would do? What would be a sensible thing for a team to do in that case? Well, the sensible thing to do would be to speak to that product owner to help them make that decision. That's right. what I would think. Yeah, and that's what they do unless. Okay. The and if, don't make any if it happens, at, my concern is if it happens at a pace that that product owner can't keep up with. So if there's eight teams, all these things are happening. It, it doesn't happen on a schedule. It yeah, doesn't happen in a meeting. It's statistically relatively rare, okay. uh, having watched this for you know, a decade. It's not that this comes up all the time. And secondly, there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy dynamic here. Um, for example, oh, the teams never talk to users. The teams don't do analysis. Uh, therefore, the teams can't understand the business. Therefore, a business analyst will do the analysis. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The teams can't make fine-grained decisions about whether they need to talk to the product owner because they don't do the analysis and understand the business. It's a reinforcing loop. And in contrast, you can break the cycle precisely by the teams getting deeply involved in the business, talking with the customers and users, and over the years coming to deeply understand everything about the customer domain. And the more the teams are doing that, the more that they'll be able to make skillful decisions about, oh, this is a meaningful issue, a fork in the road that we need to bring up with the product owner, for example. Um, March. We got a March? Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, how do how do the sort of teams that do less interact with teams that don't do less? Like um, you know, around the product development, there's also a marketing team that needs to do marketing, or there's something that needs to happen in another team that are not following according to these uh, practices. Um, the question is a bit open-ended. Can you give me a concrete scenario? Because it's rather, I think, situational. Do you have something in mind? Yeah, we have teams, um, different teams work on a product, um, but then there's the interactions with uh, a customer support team that needs to be trained if a new product comes out or actually needs to feed in actually things they would need to be able to support. Let's, take, the, let's take them differently. So one case that you've got is working with customer support. What does the customer support group do? They, for, they need to help customers to, to set maybe the product up. They need to be able to answer the questions. 
Okay. And um, how they to... They might need to use tools to... Yeah. To, to how to today do your teams interact with customer support? Um, <coughs> on the day of the launch. I'm, I'm exaggerating here, but too late. So then it's a scramble to put things in place. But uh, do you then define policies for that? How, how do you... Well, Scrum and large-scale Scrum are silent on those questions because they're rather situational. Um, I don't want to say trivial motherhood things like do something skillful. Um, to go in a slightly tangential uh, aspect, um, thinking of this from the point of view of lean wastes um, and feedback and learning cycles, this is a bit of a branch. But, for example, having team members do tours of doer duty in customer support. Having people from customer support doing tours of duty joining a feature team can increase learning cycles. I'm C just seeing it more. It's, they are part of the system. It's part of all the pieces that need to fit together to launch the, the product. So I see you know, the system is not just the, the development or the, or the software. It's they are part of this whole system to bring something to life. So I was thinking, wouldn't you model that as well as part of the system? That's true. It's part of the system. What was the question then? Same question. Because <laughs> uh, um, you, you, you said, you know, let customer support, you know, feed in to, to have a look at, you know, have product look at their team or have engineer look at their team. Have no, not look at, join. Join and... Yeah. And, and then you said it's one system. And what was the implication of you saying it's one system? <laughs> Instead of making it ad hoc, finding a way for them to, you know, make it more of a system and more uh, a structured way. Yeah, of I understand. Together. Okay. Um, well, there are mechanisms in Scrum to make it more formal. For example, there's the definition of done. And one could add to the definition of done that the teams have considered customer support activities and have done them during the sprint uh, so that it becomes part of the regular rhythm each sprint to consider and act upon necessary customer support uh, activities. But that would be the closest that Scrum has to say on it. It's kind of a situational question. March. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, so we had a question around the uh, overall retro. So what does that kind of look like? So would it be all teams attend or you send designated no, people? No, I'll, um, I'll show you a graphic that will kind of summarize it. Whoops. Um, getting there. Here we are. So this picture uh, at the bottom, the overall retrospective, summarizes who's there. The product owner, um, some of the supporting managers, some of the scrum masters, and some team representatives, representatives from different teams. And it could be one representative from all of the teams or uh, a smattering. Uh, so as you can maybe get a feel from this, uh, people from a broad spectrum across the entire relevant system uh, to focus on improving at that level. Now, how it runs, uh, Scrum is silent, and thus large-scale Scrum is silent on purpose, not because we can't come up with good ideas. How long is it? It's the same length as a team-level retro in a two-week sprint. So what's, in a two-week sprint, what's the maximum time box? You know? Usually about an hour, isn't it? Hour and a half. So exactly the same, then, it'd be a maximum time box of an hour and a half. Um, and the two basic phases of any retrospective are analysis of something about current state and then the design of an experiment to support some kind of improvement. And those will be the two major phases, but how they're done can be whatever the group decides as useful. Okay? And actually, while you're picking it up, um, let me then actually uh, pick up the subject of 
uh, the review because it'll just take a moment and it kind of dovetails. So there's only one sprint review. Um, who's there? The product owner, usually all the team members and uh, users and stakeholders. One way to do it is what we call a sprint review bazaar, which is a kind of um, science fair approach in which you parallelize looking at the items. So, for example, and, uh, for example, this is uh, one of the, I can't remember, I think this was, this was a customer of this product that they brought in uh, for this meeting and they fed him free beer. And um, he's playing with the product and these are some team members around and they're writing on pieces of paper his feedback about the product and questions and so too at the other uh, stations. And after a time box of like 15 minutes, the product owner hits a big gong, and then everybody gets up and moves to a different workstation area to uh, look at different features that are on display. And roughly speaking, this will be like the first half of the review. And then in, in the second half of the review, all of the uh, questions and feedback are collected by, that was the product owner, the head of product management of this group, adopting less, and then he'll go through all of that uh, feedback and uh, some scribe will record decisions that are important for carrying forward. And then they move into the third major activity in the review, which is a discussion of future direction, asking for advice of where to go next, uh, what are your guys' opinions about what I should do, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's exactly the same rules as in one team scrum. So in a two-week sprint, do you know? Two hours. So a maximum of two hours. Uh, so one of the noteworthy points about large-scale scrum is that it adds almost no other meetings on top of one team scrum. So it's quite lightweight in that sense, with the exception of the overall retrospective. Uh, let's go to December, so the December babies aren't feeling left out. Got a December? Hi. Uh, my question is around the how do you uh, put the item in the product backlog? Does it come from the product uh, roadmaps or the team decide what should go into it? Do, we, do you validate before you put the item in, in the backlog? The um, content of the product backlog is the controlled by the product owner, uh, not by the teams, if I understood your question. Now, the product owner and teams could establish a policy that the teams can type stuff in whenever they discover items and flag it for the product owner to look at as a tentative item. But ultimately, the product owner gets to decide what's in there and its priority. But I'm not sure I've answered your question. Uh, what I'm interested in, do they validate the item before they put that in, in the backlog? What do you mean by validate? Well, is the idea is good or it's bad? Or does oh, it have experimentation? No. Uh, really, that's the responsibility of the product owner. And for the team to arbitrarily filter something out would be, I think, undesirable. Ultimately, you want the product owner to make that call. December. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Um, why are we insisting so much on the process to be boring? To what's that? Uh, why are we insisting so much on the process, uh, on the sprint, to be boring, uh, like full, full of these boring activities? Is it because we want the process to be super simple and repetitive, or? Um, some, did you say boring? Boring, yeah. Um, uh, that, I guess that was what, what you said when you were presenting the. No, that you've misunderstood my point. Sorry. And that's okay. <laughs> uh, my point was that when, if a person knows Scrum, and they're introduced in a lecture to large-scale Scrum, the lecture will be boring 
because uh, there's nothing new to learn. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Now, it can still be a boring sprint, but that's a sub <laughs> separate question. <laughs> Why don't you ask another question then? <coughs> and if you don't have one, that's okay. All right. N another December. Got a December at the back there? Oh, there's one way over there. Well, my name's over here, sorry. I'm, not the I'm certainly not the product owner here. And we'll go for about 10 more minutes. Um, Hi. Hi. Um, I have uh, one follow-up question for the common product owner across eight teams. Mm -hmm. Um, say if there is something like a backlog refinement meeting that a team needs to do and it has some clarifications needed from the product owner on prioritization, for example, um, wouldn't it be a bit challenging to be shared between eight teams? Wouldn't also, what be challenging? Um, a single product owner's presence, but eight teams needing this person, if they have something in the calendar, a rhythmic... Um, backlog refinement meeting. Challenging in what sense? Uh, Can you challenging in the sense, um, the product owner's time point of view. Uh, wouldn't it be challenging for the product owner to share their time between these eight meetings? There eight isn't teams. eight meetings. Eight, eight, uh, there is not eight meetings. Okay. Uh, that's a, uh, I think I understand your uh, misconception. <coughs> so, Let's take a look at uh, how PBR works a little bit in uh, less. Um, here. So it's extremely rare in less. Uh, to hold single team PBR meetings. There's two new meetings optionally available in LESS called overall PBR and multi team PBR. And um, I'll take uh, multi team PBR as an example, this one over here. This is when two, three, four teams are doing PBR in the same room at the same time. And they use a technique called rotation refinement in which in different corners of the room, different items are under clarification or refinement. And the teams rotate around them. For example, every hour they rotate to a different corner. And in this way, many teams know many items. Um, and if the product owner is participating in this meeting, uh, then it's very simple because there is just one meeting. Similar to the bazaar. Uh, it's not a uh, bizarre, the but gong and <laughs> it's not like that, but there's some yeah. analogies. And similarly, there's an optional meeting called overall PBR, which involves the one product owner and representatives from the different teams together for an hour or two. And again, that's just one meeting. So okay. it's actually quite simple. Okay, thank you. But you really, to, to get all of the details of this, you'd kind of have to read the book or attend the course and so forth. Sure. Yeah. Um, so this was my follow-up question. Do I have time to ask another one? Um, I was wondering, over the years since uh, the LESS framework was introduced, mm -hmm. have you seen any common patterns of challenges that teams have faced uh, from your case studies? Do you see patterns of challenges there? Um, yes. The most common one is that um, after five to seven years, any significant improvement is undone by new management. <laughs> and I'm not being facetious or joking. So if you look at the median number of years that a, say, a, a senior manager is responsibility for an R&D group, it's usually around five to seven years. And then what happens is that a new manager comes in and says, where's the project managers? Where's the separate single function teams? Where's the Microsoft Project Gantt chart? And so on and you so forth. You go backwards, forth. yeah. And that's the most common, I would say, pattern that I see. Okay. If you want to work in the change business, you have to have a lot of patience and low expectations. 
very much. The kind of a relentless uh, drive to carry on. Um, November, or okay, at the back there. I am actually November. I was cheating before. All right. <laughs> Um, so I have a follow-up question on the sprint retrospective yes. and the overall ones. So are we not reducing some of the benefit that we get from a conventional retrospective within a scrum team where everyone um, you know, collates their feedback and, and makes their points? In the overall retrospective with representatives representing each team, are we not um, kind of getting rid of important collaboration points between the teams? So especially when we're using continuous integration where developers and testers across teams are going to have to work together, are there not going to be key points there to raise across those teams? Um, first of all, to be clear, there's still team retrospectives. In but only at team level, though. Only at the team level. And, of course, the overall retrospective, per definition, is across all the teams together. And uh, I'm not sure, quite sure I got your point. Is your concern that there's not enough people in the overall retrospective? Yeah, I think so. So if I'm a developer and uh -huh. I'm working on some code that a developer in another team has been working on, right. and I've you know, noticed key continuous improvement points that need to be raised across the teams, right. is it not more beneficial to raise that directly with a larger group with that other developer involved rather than going raising it first in my team retrospective and then that being that point being delegated out no the, 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 so you have a misunderstanding it's not like it bubbles up it's not like things are raised at the team level retrospective and then those bubble up to the overall retrospective that's not what's going on the team retrospective is for the team period team local concerns then uh, members of the each team which can be Everybody from all teams go to the overall retrospective or less people if there's a crowd control problem. And they focus in the overall retrospective on what are our concerns at a system level. Okay, that, that definitely okay. answers it. Thank you. Yeah. And my other question, which was ours, which was um, as we scale larger, so if we have more than eight teams, um, how does less deal with that? From my understanding, isn't there the concept of product managers and... No, it's good. Uh, it's not like that. Um, I'll show a slide that I think will help summarize how it's done. So when you get huge, uh, we introduce the second less framework called less huge, which is a divide and conquer system. Dividing is always dangerous because it can lead to local optimization, siloing. Now, traditional divide and conquer is, for example, by functional activity, such as uh, analysis, test, architecture, in which the group are worshipping their activities. Another traditional approach of divide and conquer is into architectural components, component teams, front end, back end, and so forth, in which teams are worshiping their code. In less, we worship the customer. And so the way that we divide has got nothing to do with activity and nothing to do with architecture or code, but into what we call requirement areas which are giant, coarse-grained, customer-centric domains of interest. Uh, for example, uh, perhaps in some kind of a trading product, new market onboarding as one requirement area and trade processing as another requirement area. Thinking about this from the point of view of the product backlog, imagine the product backlog is a Google spreadsheet and we add a new column to it called requirement area. And then imagine that in each row, we classify items into one and only one requirement area. Once you did that, you could then sort or filter the spreadsheet and say, show me only the rows with market onboarding, or show me only the rows with trade processing. 
So then you can have a view onto the one product backlog for one requirement area. So we'll call that an area backlog. We then introduce a new role called area product owner because what led us to do this is that this person's head was about to explode. We don't want that. And so the key driver here is for the product owner's head not to explode. Therefore, we need area product owners. And this area product owner focuses in their area with their backlog doing vision prioritization in that area. And they have six, eight teams that are focused in that area. And key point, an area is gigantic. It's not small. An area never has one or two teams. An area has like six or eight teams because it's the antidote to reduce local optimization. If you were to make these areas small, you're really asking for trouble in terms of local optimization. So we want to make them as big as possible. And as big as possible is eight teams. That's when a person's head explodes. And what does the product owner do? They don't do visioning and prioritization. That's delegated to the area product owners who focus in their different areas. The role of the product owner in Less Huge is strategic investment about the life cycle of the areas. The product owner is the person who would say, trade processing, been there, done that, solved problem. Let's wind down this area and de-invest in it. And let's start up a new area, Russian bond derivatives, and uh, because there's a ton of money to be made there. And I want to invest adding a whole bunch of teams into that area and focus at that level. Uh, secondly, the product owner also is responsible for hiring and helping develop the area product owners. And in a product company, uh, this is the product management team. This will be the head of product management, and these will be other product managers who are focusing in different areas. Yeah? How do you kind of square that with Roman Fischler's view of um, the product owner? Is the product owner the product owner? I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Yeah. OK, then. Yeah. This, this is uh, from, I think, long before this stuff. Yeah. OK. Yes? Um, there are no component teams. We eliminate, uh, we eliminate all single function groups. So when you adopt less, just like in Scrum, you eliminate the architecture group, the analysis group, the UX group, the testing group. You eliminate all component teams. All single function teams are eliminated. All associated manager roles are eliminated. And we transform to full stack uh, feature teams that are cross component and cross function. Surely that will not Well, there's uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of companies around the world that have adopted less, so I'm not sure what you mean. Well, typically they, they say we do not want every team to be able to modify the security layer. We need to know specifically the oh. limited number of developers. Okay, I understand, your, I understand your point. I've never run across a product group like that, and that sounds like what I'll call a constraint. And if such a constraint exists, then that would be a case in which we would have to have a component team. And OK. But that would be kind of an edge case. Yeah. Cool. And time to close it up. Let me close with a bad joke. Um, let me see. This will be quite short. Um, a programmer walks into a bar, goes up to the bartender, and orders a triple shot of whiskey, and sees beside him on the bar stool a little frog who says, Help! I'm a beautiful princess, and I've been turned into an ugly frog by an evil witch. And if you kiss me, I'll turn back into a beautiful princess and be your girlfriend. So the programmer finishes his whiskey, picks up the little frog, puts it in his pocket, goes home. Goes to his kitchen, puts a little frog on the table, takes a beer out, just sits back and relaxes and enjoys his beer, and spends half an hour looking at the little frog. 
And then the little frog says, how come you're not kissing me? I'll turn into a beautiful princess and be your girlfriend. And the programmer says, well, you know, I've been thinking about it. I know a lot of guys with girlfriends. I don't know anybody with a talking frog. (laughs) Thank you for your time. (laughs) Thank you.